So, hi everyone. So my name is Afra Shemza. I am a multimedia artist and I work with light, abstraction and interactivity, hence the name of the talk this evening. So I'm very pleased to be here with you all. I just have a couple of housekeeping points to run through before we get started. So I found with Zoom that the most comfortable viewing experience is to have select the active viewer mode, which means that you'll only be able to see the person who is speaking. So probably me predominantly for most of the event. And then later on, um, you'll just see one person at a time. So you can probably navigate to that and find it. Um, I have invited you all in and I've kept you all on mute for the first part of the event. So if you can keep yourselves on mute, that will be great because that will avoid any audio interference for us. And also just a little note that the event is being recorded. So please do, um, just to let you know, basically it's being recorded and it will be sent out to attendees and also shared on my social media. So I'm intending to do um, an artist talk until about seven o'clock and then have half an hour for an audience Q&A. Um, if you have any questions as I'm doing the presentation, please write them in the chat. And if I see them, I'll try and answer them live whilst I'm going through if they're related to a specific project. And, um, and if not, there'll be plenty of time at the end to answer those questions and I'll try and work through the chat. And also um, later on, you can you know, show your video and unmute yourself and ask a question live if you'd like to in be involved in that way. So that's absolutely fine. So I'm just going to begin the event then. Great. So I'd like to just start at the very, very beginning um, because it gives a kind of art historical and a context to what I do and why I make the work that I make. So I'm starting here with my grandfather's work. So this is my grandfather. He was called Anwar Jalal Shemza. He was a Pakistani abstract painter who came over to London in the 50s and studied at the Slade. So he, I've been surrounded with his artworks my whole life in our family home. And he has a very unique and bold abstract style, which has really influenced me in my work and my practice. And one of the things that really um, amazed me was how his work combines kind of Western abstraction and with Eastern influences and kind of uses these, these devices fusing kind of abstract calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy and architecture with modernism to create these kind of new and bold compositions. So I've been managing the estate of my grandfather's work for the last kind of eight years and I published a, an article in Tate Etc magazine in 2016 about his work and his kind of impact and legacy that it's had on my work. And we also have had a, an exhibition at Tate Britain in 2016 um, at the a Spotlight Room display where we showed a retrospective as his. And so for me, I'm kind of deeply embedded in the sort of sharing of his work to the world. And I found that really important. And this has really helped to inform my artistic practice. But my grandfather's work wasn't really within my art school education. It wasn't in the curriculum. I'm hoping that it will be one day, um, but not so much. So I was learning a lot about 
modernism, about Western forms of abstraction. So I got really, really into and loved the Bauhaus as a movement and a school that was dealing with kind of modernism in the early sort of 1900s, so 1930s and 40s, and really loved artists like Laszlo Maholi Nagy, who was working with kinetic sculpture and light artworks. There's a light space modulator in the middle there in the top line. Um, abstract paintings, artists like Oscar Schlemmer, who were working with the body in space and geometry and thinking about our relationships to each other and spaces around us. And later on down the line, um, I got really fascinated with artists like Sol Lewitt and Donald Judd because I'd started working a lot with um, sculpture then. And so thinking about how we can take abstraction into the physical realm and create artworks that can be kind of enjoyed in 3D space. And artworks that really start to think about placing the viewer into a central kind of dialogue with them. I didn't really start using light until a lot later on in my practice. And I really was inspired with artists like Dan Flavin, um, James Terrell from the Californian Light and Space Movement, Dave Valentin and Robert Irwin. And I really found their works fascinating and light a really important and integral part of my practice. So it became sort of a tool for me to um, create works that really engage the viewer. So kind of moving from there, so I tend to make work, I make interactive sculpture and I am a sculptor. I work with traditional sculpting techniques and I fuse those techniques with the latest technology to create my pieces. And in doing so, I'm kind of trying to imagine what the role of art could be in the future. I'm interested in looking at the ideas of abstraction and thinking about modernism and the idea that there could be a universal, a simple universal language for the masses. I feel like maybe abstraction, you know, in those early times, the early 1900s, it didn't really have that effect because it was quite avant-garde for the times. And I don't think a lot of the general public really understood what abstraction was about, how it was related to um, philosophical concepts and um, the way in which we can symbolize the connection between ourselves and one another and the world through these abstract language. And I felt like I wanted to create a new visual language for a contemporary audience, one that merged ideas of modernism, minimalism, with new thoughts about how to create engaging works for the public, Think works that were interactive, works that um, were accessible to everybody despite dealing with kind of conceptual complexities and and that kind of you know ideas so i started kind of working in in this way fusing technology and sculpture together to create my pieces so i tend to work in series and each of my series deals with a different kind of conceptual theme it also, each series not only deals with a different theme, but it also has a different aesthetic quality. And so by dividing my practice up in this way, I'm able to explore many different kind of ideas that come up with me in my life and use my practice as a, as a lens to translate these kind of concepts and ideas that I deal with in my own personal journey as an artist. I tend to um, see the finished artworks fully formed in my mind before I create them. So mostly, although I will let, talk to you a bit more about the process later when I'm talking a bit more about sustainability, but mostly in my earlier works, I would see this kind of finished sculpture and then I would be um, using technological tools. So designing that in 3D um, software, looking at whether I wanted to make that out of wood, metal or plastic or different materials, creating custom and bespoke circuits that I sold to myself in my studio in North London, and then working with a programmer um, to create the interactive nature. So figuring that out together. 
I do a bit of coding, but not, I find it a lot easier. There's a lot going on there when you have to think about how to construct the artwork, how to embed light and technology, do the circuits, and then the coding as well. There's quite a lot to get your head around. Um, so I'm going to talk to you through a number of different series of my work and kind of go through some different ideas there. And there are a few videos, so do let me know if the, if the volume's not quite right. I'll, I'll try and make sure that we've got that running properly. So Composition X was the first interactive and light artwork that I made after graduating university. And the piece is from my composition series. The composition series uses an infinity mirror reflection with perspex and LEDs to create a kind of engaging infinity effect. And so as you move around the piece, you see this kind of multiple spaces um, happening in front of you. So the composition series is based on a model of the solar system that was designed by Johann Kepler in the 1600s. And back then we weren't quite sure, you know, what the solar system would look like. And his idea was that the solar system would be formed of the platonic solids. So a cube, a pyramid and a sphere. And I think he had some other, some other of the platonic solids like the dodecahedron, etc. And that there was a kind of larger sh um, shape and that we were the nuclei within that, the central sphere. And I really loved this idea because it really brings home the concept of geometry and um, how we as human beings are connected to geometry and connected to the universe and ideas of kind of the infinite expanding universe and also the micro and the macro, the kind of internal atoms and things like that. So I'll just show you a video um, which shows you how the interactivity works and then I'll tell you a little bit more about exactly how it's doing that. So you can see from the, the video there, basically the, the piece has these little sensors in three of the sides of the sculpture and they're called ultrasonic sensors. And they work in terms of kind of echolocation. So they send out like how a bat or a whale um, locates where they are in space. They send out a little ultrasonic pulse and they listen for that pulse to come back and be, it's reflected off objects or people in the space around the sculpture. So the idea is that each side is um, a different coloured light, so red, green and blue. And then depending on where the people are within the space, um, they, the sensors send the, the distance data to a computer in the artwork that then outputs the different colours into coloured light in the sculpture. So that was a bit of a mouthful, but I think, I think we've got there. Um, so do, if you've got any questions about that, I'll be talking a bit about some of the circuitry and the things that I use. So I work with an Arduino microcontroller to do that. And I do quite a lot of workshops and things. So there's a lot more to get involved with. If you're an artist and you're keen, I can definitely answer some more technical questions as we go through. So the composition series, it was a kind of springboard to start working for um, making commissions for clients and things like this. And I found that I was kind of very soon, I was commissioned by Champagne Louis Roderer who make Cristal and they asked me, they said, oh wow, your, your piece is fantastic. And can we have, 
can we have a version for ourselves that emulates our brand? And it was a really great project because it was the first time I'd been commissioned to make an artwork. And I wasn't asked to create anything that was really too different or to, you know, involve the brand too much in the artwork. So I created this interactive sculpture that emulated the sort of lively colours and notes of the wine and met the master of wine and had a kind of tasting meal and sort of got to understand the brand a bit more, which was amazing. The next piece I want to talk to you about. So a lot of my clients had seen these amazing works and they were like, wow, this is incredible. Um, but they're huge and how could we have them in our home? And so I decided to make a limited edition sculpture composition micro X that I had, it was an edition of six, which are now sold out, which is amazing. And I had them as, yeah, the kind of an offshoot from that, from that piece. So the next series I want to talk to you about is the totem series. And the totems are, have a completely different aesthetic quality, as you can see from the Infinity Mirror works. And I'd found with the Infinity Mirror works that they don't necessarily look, um, they don't necessarily have a they don't necessarily have a great quality in the light because they work so well in the dark and the infinity reflection works much better in a dark space and so when thinking about designing a new series i wanted to create an artwork that had that was a light artwork that had a great looked great in the light and also in the dark so it had a kind of dual nature so these are the pieces in the light and this is what they look like in the dark so they have a kind of a jewel and a stunning kind of different light effects depending on whether it's light and dark. So the Totem series is based upon the idea of how we, how we look and how we view balance and the balance between organic and inorganic materials. So we have the oak and the wood and the natural materials fused with these kind of strange sci-fi hieroglyphs and the light and the technology inside them. These pieces formed a lot of different works. So I created a number of those light works that are, that are held on the wall. In the background of this image, you can see Totem 2, which is a big walnut piece. And in the foreground, you can see Totem NK1, which is a sound reactive um, sculpture that responds to the sound around it and the sound that a viewer makes in space. The Winter Lights Festival, these were shown at the Winter Lights Festival for the first time in 2017. And the artworks, I showed a selection of works from my catalogue, many of which I'll talk to you about this evening. And it was an amazing platform to showcase the work to tens of thousands of people. I think maybe, yeah, tens of thousands of people. It was, it was a fantastic place to really get the work out there and sort of the biggest show that I've done to date. Um, so, Moving, oh yes, I just wanted to show you this. I'm sort of giving you a few little sneak peeks as we go through the event. And this is a, an artwork that I literally finished making yesterday. So this is a new commission for a client which is based on the Totem series and has, it's just slightly longer and slightly wider and has a bespoke design. So it tends to be that my clients might see something that I've made previously and they kind of want to commission something along those lines, which is brilliant. So that's hot off the press. I'm get, I haven't even had professional photographs taken yet. These are just shot on my phone. So that's all happening next week. So I thought it would be a nice thing to share with you this evening. So the next piece I want to share with you is from the Diffuser series and this was the first time that I'd ever made works with a reclaimed lighting fixture. So I actually, it was actually Keith from Canary Wharf, Keith Watson, the curator from Canary Wharf, that showed me that they were, when I was there doing the exhibition, he showed me they were getting rid of these lighting fixtures from the office buildings. And then normally they have fluorescent tubes in them and they were throwing them all out so they could replace them with LED, um, which is great. But it meant that there was this huge wealth of amazing technology um, and light art fixtures available for me that I could have to make my work with. So these works are sound reactive. They have a small microphone inside them, and an Arduino microcontroller. And they have a, um, and they basically interact with the viewer and the sound around them. 
And these works are, they are sort of diff different shapes depending on the lighting fixtures that I, that I could find and that I've repurposed to make these works with. So you can see here some works that I actually made earlier this year. These are quite new. And this one again is a D6. So they, they have a sort of similar visual quality and they're all sound reactive. Um, they're just kind of made in these different locations. So I'm just gonna show you a video of this and show you how that, it, that works in space. Oh yes, I had um, Bucket on the chat now, sorry, just having a look. So yes, we, I exhibited these artworks that I made this year at Mars and Beyond Immersive Exhibition. So this is this next slide. So you may have seen this work. This was the, the last exhibition that we did, that I did before lockdown, the final day of this show. Taking that down was the last kind of work commitment I did in central London before the lockdown happened. And um, yeah, it might even be the only face-to-face -face exhibition I do this year. It's very strange, isn't it, these times that we're living in. But the Mars and Beyond Immersive Exhibition was a, a show curated by Oscar Krodowski. And it was all centered around sustainability in the arts, artists working with ecological concerns, artists working with recycled materials. And also there was this idea of what the, um, of what should we be colonizing Mars? Should we be kind of thinking about another planet and how, if we did do that, um, how we would want to imagine our new society so that we kind of take these ideas and kind of imagine a better future for everybody. So these are a few images of that. I will, I have all lots of links that I'll be dropping in the chat towards the end of the event. So there'll be lots of links to all these different things that you can kind of pick up with if you want to do some further research and thinking about that. Oh yeah, so just peppering the, the, um, the presentation with sort of things that are happening right now. So a client of mine saw the work at the Mars and Beyond exhibition and I'm currently building a smaller version for them to have in their home which is happening right now as we speak. So that's very exciting. It's always really lovely to be able to work on bespoke commissions for clients and um, yeah get that kind of out there. So the next series I want to talk to you about is Symphonica. And Sinfonica is another sound reactive series. This piece again uses a microphone and it is now analyzing the sound in a slightly different way from the first, from the diffuser series. So the diffuser series analyzes the volume of the sound around it and it works kind of like a transducer. So it goes up and down depending on the volume in the space. Whereas Sinfonica analyzes the high middle and low frequencies of the sound in the space around it. So here we've kind of taken the sound interaction one step further and we use a Raspberry Pi rather than an Arduino in this, these pieces because it's doing kind of more complex coding and analyzing. I love sound reactivity because it gives you this immediate engagement with the viewer. So the viewer automatically, it's just straight away they get it. They're like, oh, oh, if I'm speaking, this artwork is moving, it's doing, it's changing and moving to my, to my speech or to me clapping. And I really love that kind of playful nature. And it sort of, it makes everyone kind of perform in a way. So I was asked to, I was commissioned to make a, an interactive street piano called Symphonica. So last year, this was actually on show until April this year. It's potentially still there. I don't know if they've, they've pulled it off yet. But the Canary Wharf Group took part in this, um, this project called the Play Me, I'm Yours piano project, where they put street pianos all around the Canary Wharf estate for any passers-by to come and play them. And I was commissioned to make a, an interactive sound street piano so I made one from my Symphonica series where I used similar kind of LEDs and the techniques and embedded a microphone and that was in the public and I really love that idea of 
taking art out of the gallery space and into a public space and allowing other people to you know anyone to just come across it and play with it and engage with it and it was amazing because i kept getting these incredible uh tags for on my social media by these young geniuses doing these doing these amazing kind of piano pian, piano play, pieces which were just incredible um so it was definitely very worthwhile doing that so this year i've also been working with a 3d artist to start visualizing some of my concepts on a more architectural scale because i feel like i've been working in an object-based way often because it's what I can manage myself. And I've also found it really important to create artworks that are relational to a human being so that don't necessarily dwarf them. Because of its interactive nature, I want, I want the audience to be able to interact and not feel kind of dwelled, overwhelmed by the scale. However, I'd love to see some of the works in an architectural setting. So this would be Symphonica, if you imagine on the side of the BFI or the Hayward Gallery or something, you know, on South Bank, where you could have all of these lights that were interacting with the sound and the space around them in terms of that, which I think could be really exciting. So watch this space. These are kind of renders that are hopefully being pitched to different places um, over the next course of the year. So moving a bit more forward so the black square series was based on a exhibition at the Whitechapel gallery that i saw in 2015 i think it was and it was called the adventures of the black square so it was based on malevich's black square painting of the early 1900s that was a black square on a canvas that was all it was and it was a really kind of political and radical act to have painted this black square um, and it was destroyed and remade many, many times. And I thought the whole story, you know, I knew about Malevich's work before and I thought it was fascinating. And I thought the exhibition was just brilliant because it was sort of the adventures of the Black Square. I think it was from 1945 to 2015, you know, the 100 years of the adventures of the Black Square from the early kind of ideas of abstraction through to artists working with technology and so I really wanted to create my own version of the black square too. So I sort of fused these abstract modernist and sort of kind of suprematist minimalist features into a light artwork that um, the lights change over time to an algorithm uh, which is really sort of meditative and has this really kind of slow meditative quality to it. I will just play you this video of polychromy um, and then I will talk a little bit more about what that what that work was about and how it came to be. This artwork is called Polychromy, and it was the first collaboration between my partner, Mowgli, who's also an artist and myself in 2018. So we had just moved into our new home studio in North London. And he's also an artist and an audiovisual performer. And we had never made work together before, but on being together, and obviously we're both creating in the studio, we really wanted to explore creating something together and we had these kind of old plumbing tubes knocking around and we thought oh what happens if you put an led inside that and how can we create sort of a form with these with this material and create a kind of lightscape of leds that explore that explore pure form and color um, in that way so this was actually commissioned by Collider Festival in 2018. So we showed it there and then we also showcased it at the VNA Digital Design Weekend, which was fantastic with 
um, the Art in Flux, which is an artist not-for-profit organisation that I co-founded with two other artists in 2016, Maria Almina and Oliver Greengrick. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Art in Flux a bit later on, but just kind of referencing that there. So you can see me there with my work very proudly at the v &A, which is great. So I will play you this video of another, which a seconds pass, which was a commission by Save the Children. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that after I've played the video. So this piece was a commission for Save the Children and it was the first time that I'd worked with data visualization as a kind of concept. So they came to me with these um, statistics about birth rates of children in the world and also death rates of children under five years old. And so the challenge was to figure out how to animate, how to take that data and then use it to sort of display, um, you know, when there was a death in the world happening and try and do that in real time. And it was, it was a really fascinating and really important project and I was very happy to be a part of it. It was great. I also sold it. I was going to buy the festoon lights um, off the shelf, but I ended up having to, with, there was lack of time in the project and I ended up having to basically solder all of the individual LEDs inside the spheres myself, um, which was probably about a week of kind of 18 hour days soldering. Uh, so I probably won't be embarking on anything quite as intensive as that in the future, but it was really important. It felt like a really important thing to get to make happen, which was really great. Post Truth and Beauty, so the coder that I worked with on Seconds Pass is an artist called Tim Murray Brown, who's an amazing artist and programmer and composer. And he, I met him in 2017 when he came and asked me to be a part of a commission that he had had called Post Truth and Beauty. And I'll just play you a, a short excerpt from the video about that installation. And this was the very first time I'd worked spatially rather than create an object, making a kind of interactive installation. So that was incredible to do. My name is Tim Murray Brown. This piece is called Post Truth and Beauty and it's a collaboration with the artist Afro Shemza. When I was designing the piece, I was trying to find a way of um, designing something that looks like it's part of a bigger system 
that the rods themselves kind of extend further than the gallery walls, um, through the walls, through the floor. Um, and the idea was to create a uh, kind of composition from very, very small amount of parts, really. So creating this kind of spatial structure, but um, with only using very small uh, kind of rod-like system. experience of the piece we wanted to kind of create this sensory experience of never quite being able to grasp the entirety of what's going on. So there is a sound composition but it's composed in space and as you move through the space you can hear different parts of it but never the whole thing all at once. And likewise with the light which we've composed on these LED strips and the rods. There are different parts of a complete world that you can see but you can only see it through these tiny little slithers and only as you move your head around and each position that you move your head into you'll see a slightly different perspective onto it. So the whole experience is designed to give you this feeling of there being something in there, like there being something real there, but for yourself you can't see it from one perspective and as soon as you change your perspective the world itself changes around you too. This piece basically sort of came about because we were in a kind of Trump had just been elected and we were sort of starting on the whole kind of Brexit idea and and there was this notion floating around that we were in a post-truth era and the idea you know how, with fake news and not knowing what to believe and how you should be looking at politics and how to kind of critically analyze and understand the world around you. And so this piece was trying to encapsulate that, those notions of that there must be truth under here somewhere and I must be able to understand my relationship to the world and to what's happening around me, but that it almost always sort of keeps being blocked or we can just glimpse these little moments so we can hear some of this sound or see some of these, the sort of lights and truths kind of glimpsing through all the other stuff that we're kind of bombarded with. So that was a really interesting concept uh, that Tim kind of brought to the table and I did the sort of spatial design um, for that piece. So I'm going to move through into a, a project that I started last year that was called Solutions for a Sustainable Art Practice. So in producing all of those works and those series that I spoke to you about, that I've been speaking to you about so far, I found I'd basically started to sell my work and I'm working a lot with technology, a lot of my clients have started asking me um, how they should best look after my work, what happens if something were to break, and how we could conserve and look after it. And so these ideas of legacy and conservation and, and also not wanting to contribute to our waste and consumer society, basically, not wanting to contribute technological waste, not wanting my artworks to become obsolete and kind of, you know, contributing to the, the culture that we sort of find ourselves in. So I felt like I needed a little bit of time and space to really start grappling with these ideas and thinking about how I can use more sustainable work uh, materials to make my work. And so I was really lucky to receive the Developing Your Creative Practice grant by the Arts Council England for my project, Solutions for a Sustainable Art Practice. And this project was a three month artist development project where I was artist in residence at a makerspace in North London called Building Blocks, where I usually work anyway. Um, I rent a bench there and I work a lot with their big machines. They've got big panel saws and uh, kind of milling machines and all sorts of stuff. So I can make my sculptures there and then I do the soldering and everything back in the studio. And I had an artist residence there for three months and I was looking at taking my two core materials that I work with, wood and plastic, 
and learning new skills and developing new techniques for working with more sustainable materials. I had a photographer with me the whole time I was in there and she was documenting my process because the, the point of the project was not only that I was learning new skills, but I wanted to show other artists what I was doing and in the hope of trying to encourage every, all of us to be more mindful about the type of materials that we use to make our work. So here you can see my desk and what was going on kind of week to week. So in the wood workshop, I had, I worked with a master craftsman, Archie Hands, and I had a week of intensive lessons and learning from him, working with rough sawn timber, which I sourced from a local timber supplier called Saunders Seasonings. And the supplier saves trees, timber, from development sites in London that would otherwise be chipped and burned and repurposes them for creative use. So he's very close to where I live in my studio. And he, and so basically I could walk over to where he is, pick up my timber and get it to the studio and start working with it. So it was a really amazing kind of closed loop production of working with this reclaimed and sustainable material. So I learned how to take rough sawn timber, plane and thickness it on the planer, how to cut it with a chop saw and plane it, and how to do kind of more traditional um, woodworking, like mortise and tenon joints that you can see in the bottom right hand corner. So not only was I learning how to work with this new material that I'd never worked with before, I was also trying to understand how I could embed technology into the, into the timber. So I worked a lot with routers, routing out sections so that I could embed LED strips and kind of put my Arduino and items like that within the timber itself. And my favorite, favorite bit was seeing the, was oiling up the wood at the end because it's such a beautiful natural material. It just brings out all the wood grain and everything so wonderfully. So for the first time, I know I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the first time I actually let the material sort of, and the process guide me and help me to create the works that sort of came out at the end of this. And so what happened was it was quite a liberating experience really, because I was able to take the wood and sort of look at that and sort of try and figure out how, what the artwork wanted to look like from incorporating the organic the organic elements. So here we've got a piece of London plain and it's got these lovely kind of wany edges and I felt like that to me was kind of like a landscape in some ways. So using it kind of horizontally and embedding technology in this way to kind of create this horizon line felt really natural, natural for me. And one of the things that was kind of interesting about this project was that I hadn't really intended when I started to actually make artworks that were about the climate crisis or ecological concerns. But of course, as soon as you start thinking about these ideas and concepts, it becomes quite an important thing actually to start making some works that really say something, you know, that can contribute actively to the ecological movement and the climate movement and to start kind of speaking and investigating these concepts within my work. What I'm really trying to advocate is a kind of seamless integration of sustainable practice within media arts practice um, and also maybe, you know, within our daily lives. And this piece was called Current Climate and it's a data visualization piece that visualizes news headlines in four different countries in the world. And whenever a headline is kind of posted on, a, on the website of these news, news sources, the lights in the artwork glitch. So you can basically see when we're talking about climate change as a keyword, and then there are other keywords that we've used that are to do with freak weather and stuff like that. So you can kind of see, oh, what's happening around the world? When is it happening? And when are we talking about it? And it was really important for me to kind of do that in real time. So data visualization in real time to show mainly really that we're not talking about these concepts enough. Although, of course, with the Extinction Rebellion and things that have been going on in, in London and in the world kind of last year, they were really kind of spiking and moving and being really animated, which was, which was really great to see. So with my plastic workshop, I had previously worked a lot with Perspex, 
and I wanted to start thinking about using recycled plastic and how I could create my own sheet material from my own waste. I'd found that in trying to find other studios that created recycled materials or recycled plastic, that there was a real lack of plastic, recycled plastic that was, that had a really lovely quality. They were mostly kind of gray and sort of not very nice materials. There's one company that I did find called Smile Plastics and they make these really beautiful bespoke panels. But as a singular kind of individual creator, their panels are quite expensive and so it's not not a very possible to integrate those into into my own individual works if I'm not being commissioned so the idea for me was how can I repurpose my waste and turn it into a material to create my work with so how can I work with waste materials and kind of imbue them with value and not have to you know not for it to cost the earth literally and also for me to cost the earth so I found this company online called Precious Plastics and they're a company based in the Netherlands that have, they've basically let, they have given open source designs for plastic recycling machines. So the designs that they have allow anyone to basically look at those designs and recycle their plastic waste so you can take plastic you can shred it with the machine on the left and then you can use those shredded materials to create sheet material or to kind of injection mold it and create phone cases and this sort of thing and i was really inspired by what they were doing and how they were set up i didn't necessarily want to create those machines so i wanted to see if there was a way of doing it in a much more diy way with things that you could buy off the shelf, like a conventional kitchen oven, um, toasty makers and a Nutribullet, things like that, that you could just kind of buy and repurpose. And so there are many different types of plastic and they all have different qualities to them. So they all have different melting temperatures, they have different, um, they're brittle or they kind of let, let fumes and things kind of happen at different temperatures and stuff like that. So for me, it was really important to work with, I worked with HDPE, which are things like milk bottles and food containers and LDPE, which are things like bubble wrap and plastic bags. And I worked with those two different types of materials because they have a very low melting temperature. So it meant that I could get my machines up to temperature easily without having to use something that wasn't domestic. And also because they become malleable at a very low temperature before they start releasing toxic fumes. So of course that was really important. I was in a workshop where we had amazing ventilation, but it was really important to be able to work with these materials in a kind of uh, eco-friendly way. And obviously in a way that wasn't going to endanger myself whilst I was doing it. So I've just got a couple of videos that will show you what, how I recycled the, the waste materials. So this is the LDPE method, bubble wrap and plastic bags. With my plastics recycling, it's low density, so it's all the stuff that's kind of a bit stretchy and a bit flexible, basically. And the process is that I put bubble wrap and plastic bags on a baking tray and put it into the oven and melt it and it will shrink in size. And then after it's shrunk in size, I mold it into a ball. And then I put that into a hydraulic press and compress that with lots of pressure and leave it there for about 20 minutes. And what I end up with is a beautifully compressed material that is nothing like bubble wrap or plastic bags or anything like that. It's a kind of totally new material in itself, really. So what I think is really lovely about this particular recycling method is that bubble wrap and plastic bags currently cannot be recycled already. So they really are a waste material. And so I was able to basically take this completely valueless material, put it through this process and create these kind of beautiful, rich, marbled materials and textures that I was then able to imbue with value and create new artworks with. So these are some of the pieces that I created. These are compositions one to four made from recycled bubble wrap and plastic bags. All of the frames as well are made from a reclaimed teak door. So the 
wood has been recycled and kind of planed in thickness to make the frames. The thing with the plastics recycling is that the the whole process of gathering the materials, washing the materials, um, melting the materials, and then kind of creating the sheet, sheets with that, is that that takes a lot of time. So I was really struggling for time at the end of this project to be able to think about what the artworks were going to be. And I feel like these are really the beginnings of um, a whole series of works that I'd like to make with using this technique. And I definitely like to bring in some of the interactive elements and kind of educational ideas from some of my other projects into this series. So these are some, and these are some that I didn't use light with because they just look so lovely. They were like paintings almost. And again, it was a really liberating experience for me because when you put the plastic into the hydraulic press, there's not really any way of knowing what's, what the piece is gonna look like when it comes out. So it's very exciting and I really loved doing that. So the second method was with LDP, uh, HDP, sorry, milk bottles and, plas and food containers. And I learned the method of recycling for this from a East London makerspace called Machines Room. And they show me how to do it with Nutribullet and Toasty Makers and things like that. So I will show you another video which explains that technique. So I'm cutting up milk bottles and HDP and putting it into a Nutribullet, which then grinds it all up into a nice kind of powdery substance. I put it into a toasty maker and I've got two metal plates um, and some spaces around the edge to get the depth of the plastic. And I'll pour that in there, close the lid of the toasty maker and um, clamp it shut for about eight or 10 minutes. And then I take that material out afterwards, let it cool down and shape it with a bandsaw and just sand it off the edges. This technique is really lovely because it's something that really anyone can do. Anyone can buy a Nutribullet, anyone can buy a Toasty Maker. And I really love this idea. And so these are some of the works I created with sort of food containers and milk bottles. And I, one of the great things that came from the plastic recycling, the techniques that I learned, I immediately turned into a day's workshop and I've run probably about uh, six or seven of these with 10 students or six, six students a time and the students come and they learn they start thinking about sustainability in within their work and how to recycle their own plastic waste and turn it into artworks or here you can see some rings and jewelry and coasters and things like that so I'm hoping that I'll be able to kick those back off again next year when it's safe to do so with social distancing so thinking about educational workshops and how you bring the ideas of sustainability and the things in which I've been learning about in my own practice. I wanted to create um, a peer resource online for artists who also were thinking about how to be more sustainable with their practice. So I created a piece called um, a website called artology.co.uk and this is an artist-led resource for artists who want to be more mindful about the materials in which they use to make their work. So there, it's split up into a few different sections and the idea with it is to not kind of enforce ideas or thoughts about what we should be doing on, any, of, on the artist, but to ask a series of leading questions to think about, so that artists could think about what the materials that they're using to make their work. And there's a whole load of links and resources to sustainable suppliers. And I'd really like to continue this project and make it into a website that could be altered and changed by other people as well. So we could all kind of communally add in our um, knowledge and understanding in this area. And there's one thing that I found really, really fascinating and really important about this project was that when you start working within the sustainable and the climate change kind of the climate crisis world everybody all the organizations want to collaborate with each other they want to share their resources they want um, to further knowledge and research and about all these things and i think it's just fascinating how 
that works and just really incredible thing to be a part of and one that I want to keep kind of contributing to as I move forward in my practice. The project ended in an Art in Flux event that I curated last year. So Art in Flux is the not-for-profit organisation that co-founded in 2016 for artists working with technology. And we had Radical Ecology Sustainable Media Art, which happened last year at Ugly Duck with the artists Oscar Trudowski and Becky Lyon and Laura Pando from Julie's Bicycle chaired that event. And it was great because she was able to give a context into the global kind of climate crisis and movement around ecological concerns and that was really key and sort of helped to contextualize what I was doing as an artist and also what we as artists are kind of doing within the greater movement. There was an exhibition and there's also video of this on our website so I'll share the links for that if anyone's interested in having a look and doing some further research. So I'm aware we've got to 7pm, so I'll just whiz through my what's next slides before we open up to the, to the floor for everybody. So thank you for staying with me. So a few sneak peeks into some projects that I've got coming up over the next few months. So I'm going to be embarking on a project that's called The Square and the Circle, which is related to my grandfather's work, who I spoke to you about a bit earlier this evening. So my grandfather created this work called one to nine and one to seven and in Urdu it reads across the the painting there it reads one circle one square a puzzle for which one lifetime is not enough to solve and this is also a kind of formula for his visual compositions moving through his life and I thought well that's interesting as a just as a starting point for a project and I thought well if it wasn't enough time in his lifetime to solve this puzzle of a circle and a square and kind of the visual language and thinking about metaphysics and kind of spirituality and our connections to one another, maybe I can continue this within my lifetime and my practice. So the idea with the work is to create a bespoke drawing software that could be on online, that will be online and there'll be workshops for how people can use it and people will be able to take these visual elements that were used within my grandfather's work and are used within Islamic geometry and create their own compositions in 3D space. From there I would like to take their compositions and host them in a kind of online catalogue so that will be part of that and then the everybody's compositions will all come together to create a generative light art installation that I want to be kind of quite large probably holographic I haven't quite figured out the technology behind it but you can see some renders that we've been working on literally you know in the last kind of couple of weeks so it's a very exciting project and it's in its infancy but I'm really looking forward to kind of getting started with that and kind of first we'll be creating the drawing software in the workshops and kind of moving through to the conceptual idea about how the genera generative aspect will work and how everybody's designs will kind of come together to form one whole. I will be curating and I'll be presenting this part of this work at the National Gallery X as Art in Flux currently have a residency with the National Gallery X and we are hosting and curating different talks throughout the year. And my one will be called Shifting Ground and it will, I'll present some of my work from the, the Circle and Square project and curate other artists that are working with cultural heritage in new media art. So that's what we're going to be exploring in that event. I have just released a uh, hot off the press in the last couple of weeks, a new series of limited edition prints. So I'd never done prints before and it, I decided to do them. They are based on a my totem series, an individual light art piece. And they're part of the Artist Support Pledge, which was an amazing initiative set up by Matthew Burroughs Studio at the beginning of the pandemic. And the idea was that artists would lower their prices to create artworks that were 200 pounds or less and then we would depending on the sales that we created if we reached a thousand pounds in sales then we we basically buy an 
an artwork from another artist who's participating in the pledge. And it's just a fantastic initiative that has really taken off and gone boom. And it creates this, this support network, a financial support network for artists um, working within the pandemic. And so I've just recently launched these prints and I'm really looking forward to purchasing another piece from an artist soon and being a part of this kind of new generosity and sort of sharing community between in the arts to kind of support each other through these difficult times. So I'll drop a link in the chat to those if you are interested in them. Of course, having more time and space to myself, I've also got a new website, which I'm going to be launching soon. I was hoping to have it done today, but lots of technical um, things going on with that. And I will hopefully be launching that next week. A part of the website, I've been working on creating my artworks in 3D. So the piece on the left there, you can see working with the 3D designer is a 3D render of one of my composition pieces made from recycled plastic. And this is now going to be embedded into my website and so that people can view the artworks that I create in 3D space because sometimes it's quite difficult for people to get a handle on what the light art looks like basically. And what we're also exploring now is how to is augmented reality. So we're working on a piece of technology that will allow people to download my 3D models, so download my artworks into their phone, and then they'll be able to view them within their homes or within a gallery space. So this is really, really exciting and groundbreaking stuff. And I'm really looking forward to being able to share that with everybody. So you kind of get this internal and intimate relationship with the artwork from viewing it in, within your own home. The next event, I'm actually curating an event with Art in Flux again in on the 18th of August and this will be a Flux Live, which is live streamed events and it will be all about audiovisual performance. So I've invited three artists, Anna Nazo, who you can see in the background image there, who is going to be doing a drone performance, Mowgli, my partner, who works with audiovisual performance and Mark Pilkington and the three artists will showcase live performance alongside some interviews that I'll be holding with them. So I'm really looking forward to that event and I hope that some of you can make it. I will share a link in the chat. And I think that is me done for the presentation. So it's about 10 past seven now. So I'd love to open it up to all of you to see if you have any questions because I've been speaking for quite some time now. So I don't know if you want to write any questions that you'd like me to answer in the chat or you could unmute yourself. I have got a question in the chat from Bart who says, do you think it's possible and or should it be possible to create an egalitarian experience between an artwork and the audience? So I'm going to answer that question first. Yes, yeah, so there's a few, there's a couple of questions in that. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? With interactive art, you, I am restricting the parameters with which someone can interact with my sculpture. So I, and what's important for me as an artist is that the artwork still looks engaging and inviting, even if someone is not interacting with it. So it has to have a kind of aesthetic quality that brings someone over in the first instance and get them, gets them to engage with it. So often with a lot of my works, I will have like a sleep mode with the lights or something. So it looks like something is happening before the person starts interacting with it. And then of course, yeah, I give someone parameters, don't I? So I give them, I say, well, this work, you can interact with it, it with sound and the parameter that you're interacting with it is your volume or the parameter that you're interacting with is high, middle and low frequencies. And so I'm not, it's not the same as maybe in a game where there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more parameters and you can kind of stop playing the game or kind of move away from the piece. I still want there to be a kind of instant gratification kind of thing going on with my work. So I guess in a sense, it's not, it's not totally 
yeah, egalitarian in that sense. Because I hope that answers that question a bit, a bit more. Um, then I have another question, which is, considering me being a composer and now seeing post-truth and beauty and your Symphonica large scale concept, how does sound as an element of the artwork place itself in that experience? So post-truth and beauty was the first time that I'd worked with a, compo a composer and actually used sound in the artwork itself. And mostly I'm working with sound reactive artwork. So they don't play sounds themselves, they respond to sound in the space. So I think for me, it's kind of more about the relationship between the viewer and the artwork. And I like the, the way in which it's so immediate and, and engaging how sound is interactive. So I think on a larger scale with that, those kind of architectural ideas, it will mainly be responding to kind of the sound around it um, and kind of thinking about that as a, as an idea. But I think in terms of being a composer, I mean, Post Truth and Beauty was really fascinating to work with Tim because I'd never kind of considered interactive sound, how that works, you know, interactive sound and how you can split a, he's basically got a kind of a whole sound composition that is split up into many different parts, which are controlled by the movement of the head within the space. And I'd never seen anything, you know, I never experienced anything like that before. And it's really magical when you're, you're kind of listening over here and there's a whole ring of speakers around you and you're kind of listening over here and there's a boom, boom, and then you kind of move back and you've got a melody happening over there. And it, it's really, really groundbreaking and really fascinating interactive sound design. Um, we're actually, I'm actually been in conversation recently about, uh, with a, a software developer who's currently creating a interactive sound software that's just being launched for the European uh, commission with some funding from them and it sounds really really interesting and really groundbreaking I can't quite remember the name off the top of my head but I will um, add it in because I think a lot in in gaming and interaction that the sound kind of gets left out so it's like oh we've got all this incredible interactivity but oh we forgot about the sound <laughs> and so there's actually not that much software available out there for people to use and so they've got this kind of groundbreaking thing that they're going to be de dealing with which is absolutely fascinating so I'll share a link with that um, I have another question that's just appeared in the chat, which says, have you done artworks that are interactive to the viewer's movements? So, yeah, actually one of my earlier works, which I didn't show in this presentation, actually used the Xbox Connect and a, it was a screen-based work. So it used the Xbox Connect to uh, map the viewer's motion and then display a kind of interactive geometric screen behind that. And so that was this interactivity. And, but I decided not, I actually, it was really funny because actually at a similar time, I met Maria Almina, who's one of my, amazing co-founders of Art in Flux and an inspiration to me and a collaborate, close collaborator with Art in Flux and the curation. And she runs a, an, a studio called Kimatica Studio and they were doing this with live performance and connect and projection and light and wearable technology. And when I saw what they were doing, I was just sort of blown away and I thought, brilliant. They're doing that and they're doing it unbelievably well. So I will go the um, sculptural route because I felt like this was a, the sort of route that I wanted to take and work with kind of materials. And it was just really lovely to do that. Um, oh, a lovely quote there coming in from Maria. Um, so, but what I have done is artworks that respond to the viewer. So not so much the viewer's movements like a connect will respond to the head or um, hands or things like that, but artworks that respond to objects, a viewer in space using ultrasonic sensors. So they ping sound frequencies off the viewer and um, 
the artworks react to that. And by doing that, it allows me to kind of embed the technology that I'm using within the objects that I'm making and not have to have a kind of connect in a different place in the installation or a camera somewhere else. It means that my objects can be self-contained and the circuits can be self-contained within that. So I have like a sensor pointing out in one direction, one pointing in another direction, and then kind of have that interactivity. So I've done that a bit, but definitely more, more so now I'm looking at and especially now thinking about um, a post pandemic, you know, world where interaction even more now wants to be touch less. So using distant sensors and maybe pressure sensors on the floor and things like that are going to become really important. And kind of, I think things like, you know, using technology like VR and things like that is going to become a bit more difficult or using uh, buttons and things as technological devices. You know, it's going to be a much more about the body in space and how to create kind of seamless integration with things like that. Um, I'm just wondering, so I've run out of questions in the chat. Does anyone want to jump in? You're more than welcome to unmute yourself and say something. Oh, we've got another one from Mark. We've got with sustainable materials, e.g. bubble wrap and plastic bags put through the hydraulic press, can you project light through them like lighting gels? Yes. So if the material that you're putting into the press, so bubble is already see-through, so bubble wrap is a really good example of that, then the thing that you get out will be see slightly see-through. And then, so what I was tending to do is to use bubble wrap and sort of see-through materials as the base for the work, and then mix in, then the color that I'm adding in are the color of the plastic bags. So then I'd mix in smaller amounts of, so if I wanted a blue marble texture, I'd have the base would be bubble wrap, and then I would mix in blue plastic bags and then mold that together and put that through the press and then so the bubble wrap would be slightly more see-through and the the blue would be slightly more and you can actually you can put the material through the process again and again and again and but the more that you put the material through the process the less translucent it becomes um, so the the ones that look a bit more like painting i was using kind of tesco carrier bags and things like that that are white whiter and they don't have that quality of see-through nature and then they become then you kind of can't see quite through them but the milk bottles also do a similar thing so milk bottles are kind of translucent they're not see-through but they're translucent so they also let light through and it's just about kind of playing and experimenting and mixing the different colors together i hope that answered that question <laughs> um, do we have any more questions? I've got a couple here that I can answer. Does anyone want to unmute themselves? Well, we've got Maria, Maria on the chat saying, did you have any challenging audience reactions to your pieces so far? I'm trying to think in terms of challenging audience reactions. I think something that I was talking about earlier today was um, kind of to do with challenges and what are the challenges positioning yourself within the ecological realm, you know, as an artist, what happens when you start talking about sustainability in your work and, and how, what are the challenges there? And, and I think, it was really fascinating with the event that we ran called Radical Ecology and we had some really challenging questions from the audience, you know, and everybody was very, very passionate about this subject and I think it's really important there. But I think one of the things that was key with this project and also with the way in which I talk about it is that I want to I really want to, I don't have all the answers and I'm only just beginning this journey. You know, I only just started my kind of sustainable journey last year. And I really feel like it's important to make that point that, you know, it, we're all in this together and we're all sharing our resources and our, and our knowledge. And it's about 
starting this journey that is difficult and creating spaces for every for people to come and discuss these kind of ideas and concepts to, together so that we can grow and change and learn and if nobody kind of sticks their neck out a little bit just to say something or do something a bit a bit different then it's very hard to um, begin that process and so I'm there ready to sort of say hey let's start this I don't know all the answers and it's and the more that I go down this route it's kind of like a rabbit hole and you get thrown many many different kind of things come in and you're sort of like oh no I didn't think about that or but I think hey let's let's go for it and see what happens so I hope that kind of answers that question I've got a little question coming from Lisa Pettibone which says when is your next light sculpture workshop yeah oh it's been so difficult this year i think with the workshops because i had to cancel a few of them um with the pandemic and the self-isolation so i actually think i think i'm probably not going to be doing workshops this for the rest of this year i'm afraid but so i'll probably start in january next year to be doing the light sculpture workshop lisa is referring to a an interactive light sculpture workshop that i started running in 2018 and it's where I teach students how to work with the Arduino and do basic electronics and then um, soldering and things like that and we create bespoke sculptures over the course of a weekend so I'll definitely be going back to this again for sure and at the moment I'm designing some online courses that would hopefully be possible for people to do from the comfort of their own homes and just trying to work out how that works in terms of um, delivering electronics and things like that to people or you know how they source those things and how to teach soldering or, or online you know so it's a whole other realm to try and figure out but um really fascinating oh lovely from pearl there who's come to one of the workshops saying she had a lovely time on the workshop so thank you Pearl. that's great um i've got another question come through from Biquette, which says you talked about the aftercare of your work for the pieces you commissioned, how did you deal with it? They are technological pieces, Arduino for example, I found not very reliable. Or a sculpture with a Raspberry Pi integrated is also like selling a Raspberry Pi. How do you solve it? Do you offer a warranty? Yes, so this is a really important um, part I think. If you're making technological artworks, you, you need to be able to discuss with your clients how how they're going to look after the piece and also yeah offer a warranty it's basically like a contract so looking after artworks and having them serviced is not a new thing at all so artists have been working with neon for a very long time if we take that as an example so artists like tracy emin for example she makes neon artworks this is uh, an artist that's very well known lots of people have bought her work these works are they are sold with a contract and they are it's a serviceable, they're serviceable works and they're meant to be serviced every year with Tracy Emin Neons. And every year you um, pay to have your artwork serviced. So this idea is definitely not a kind of new one. So as a technological artist, it's really good to, to think about these things and to know about these things. So I sell my works with a contract that basically says I will, um, if anything goes wrong with the artwork within two years, I will come and I will fix it for free. And if anything then goes wrong after that, then there will be a kind of a call out charge or a, you know, a kind of servicing charge after that. And I think that's a really good way of doing it basically to sort of uh, be really transparent and really open and really honest about, you know, the aftercare of the works and what and what is going to be needed to keep them alive and kicking for as long as possible um i'm just trying to think arduino i actually found arduino very reliable so i don't know um i'm not quite sure how to respond to that certain bit but um i think now having been ma making electronic works for a very long time um i actually have only really been called out to repair one piece in this whole time which is incredible really so they they the works have actually held up and have been standing up the test of time amazingly which is great uh so it's been very fantastic to do that 
Oh, great. Raquette's saying she was trying to find a suitable answer. So that's great. Yeah, that's really good. Does anyone else have any other questions that you can write in the chat? So I had one question as well. That was, oh yeah, so it was talking about kind of press and recordings and things like that. So earlier today, I was actually interviewed for a, a new book that's coming out called The Green Guide, which is going to be a, an ecological kind of book about all the green, I'm just wondering if I've, somehow made it so that you can't unmute yourselves whilst I was doing this I'm not sure but if you want to unmute yourself hopefully you can if you want to ask a question um, so this green guide is a book that's about artists working with the climate crisis and it's going to be published later on this year and there's an artist studio called the invisible flock who are going to be create curating the book and i'm very very excited to be a part of it and i can't kind of wait for that to come out so i was being interviewed about my sort of, sort of sustainable project and they're going to be doing uh, a number of things there oh we've got a question from amy goodchild which says i'm curious how you got started with making commissioned artworks did people start coming to you when you got to that place with your work or did you start marketing somehow yeah, so it's a bit of both really. I think the, I started making the artworks that I wanted to make. And so that was really important to be able to show people a portfolio and um, yeah, the kind of quality and the, how the interactivity and things kind of work. And I was exhibiting quite soon after university, I was exhibiting at Lights of Soho Gallery, which is this great gallery for which was a great gallery unfortunately doesn't exist anymore for artists working with uh, artists working with light and we had this fantastic time where I was exhibiting a lot with them and they had a lot of clients who would come through and they would be really interested in the work so I think like getting yourself out there and exhibiting and showing people what you're doing is really important for that so a lot of people did come to me so the Louis Rodera they came to me um, Canary Wharf was an open call. I'm trying to think about some other ones. And I've also had kind of agencies come to me as well. So working with people like the department, uh, Soho Curious and Co. I did a commission for a Sexy Fish Restaurant in Mayfair. That was an infinity mirror piece. Some of them are more like artworks than others. So some of them I wouldn't necessarily, they are not in my presentation, for example, because they were more commercial projects that are more like lighting design than they are conceptually artworks necessarily. But definitely marketing as well. And at the moment I'm learning a lot about how to do online marketing. So social media, how to have a website that makes your work accessible and, and makes it you know, SEO and all those kind of things that they don't teach you at art school at all. You know, what is all this business, business and um, online marketing. And it's very, very difficult when you don't know those types of things. But yeah, I think, I think everything is going to be moving online a lot more recently. And it's a really good place. I think things like Instagram are fantastic for portfolio and DMing curators and museums and potential clients and collectors. So that's really, really exciting. Hopefully that's answered your question, Amy, thank you. And I've got one from Lisa, um, which says, how do you think through the light color of your works, you are representing concepts or are you responding to concepts or philosophical ideas? So it's, I suppose maybe it's not necessarily through the lighting the lighting device for me is a kind of tool that uh, brings people to the work and kind of gets them to engage with it. I think it's more through um, some of the abstraction and looking at kind of geometry and abstraction that is more to do with kind of placing the artist and the artwork, the viewer and the artwork into a central kind of dialogue with the, with the sculpture. I think I'm more talking about creating art that's accessible to everybody and kind of looking at 
equality and participation and education within uh, my projects and that in itself being kind of a political act. And if nobody else has any questions, I will end the event here, if that's okay. Thank you so much. It's been really great having you all here. So it's really fantastic to share my work with you. And I will um, look forward to seeing you more in the future at many different events that I, I do. Mm -hmm.